All right. I want to introduce myself, Scott Irwin, and my partner, Todd Hubbs. Uh, we will be doing the webinar this afternoon on implications of USDA grain stocks and prospective plantings reports for corn and soybean prices. So let's get started. Well, we want to start with this chart, uh, not to depress anybody over uh, commodity price movements, but just to make sure that everyone knows that up front, we know that we are in an extraordinary situation uh, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. And that's you know, kind of the big 60, you know, 800 pound gorilla in the room. And we, you know, that is um, overshadowing a lot of other market factors. And we just wanted you to know that our comments uh, will be taking into account some of those impacts as best as we can see them, but just have to recognize that we're in uh, historically uncharted territory. So that introduces an unusually large amount of uncertainty into taking a look at the corn and soybean supply and demand fundamentals for 2021 marketing year. So that's just a little background by way of getting started. Next slide. Okay, uh, earlier today, the USDA released their March 1st corn stocks estimate, and it was uh, 7.952 billion bushels, uh, which was considerably less than a year ago on March 1. Uh, but more importantly, it was 173 million bushels less than what the trade was expecting. Uh, so we had a bullish surprise on usage in the second quarter of the 1920 marketing year. Next slide, please. Here's the history of March 1st uh, grain stocks, corn grain stocks, USDA minus average guess. I like to call these the market surprises. And a negative number is bullish and a blue number is usually uh, bearish. And you can see that we've had a long string of March 1 bearish surprises that was broken here. Uh, 173 million is uh, for a bullish usage surprise is among the larger in the last uh, 20 years or so. So that's uh, a piece of good news from this report. I also do want to note that it's very interesting we don't have a chart on this but it is actually the fourth consecutive substantial bullish surprise in corn grain stocks reports uh, i took a look at my records todd and they the surprises or the amount that the market underestimated usage totals for the last four grain stocks report just over a billion bushels. So we've been through a period of very robust usage that the market has now for about a year kind of been uh, running to catch up to. Next slide. So the big question that we have is now estimating feed and residual use for corn uh, for the remainder of the marketing year. We now know that the first half feed and residual use for corn. We don't have the exact, exact numbers, but it, we can get pretty close at this point at 3.689 billion bushels. And the real question then is, okay, we know that number. Uh, what do we think it's going to be in the second half of the 1920 marketing year? Next slide, please. So the way we usually think about this is that the uh, first half of the marketing year will represent a percentage of the total usage for the year. For example, uh, for the 14, 15 through 17, 18, the first half of the year represented 70% of the feed and residual use um, during those years. Uh, our most recent marketing year, the first half represented uh, a bit less at 63%. So if we apply those two percentages to what we now know for the first half of 
the 1920 marketing year, we would get a range in estimates for the full year, 1920 marketing year, feed and residual use between uh, 5270 and 5855. And you can see that the current USDA's uh, 1920 projection from the March WASDE was at 5525, uh, roughly right in the middle of those two ranges. As you're going to see in a minute, we lean towards uh, something closer to that 63 to 65%, which is implying something uh, that is uh, well above the 5270. Next slide. So let's just take a look at uh, where all this puts us for uh, the old crop or 2019-20 uh, balance sheet. The first column shows the corn supply and consumption and ending stocks in the March WASDE for comparison. And then in highlighted in red, we have uh, Todd and I's estimates for the old crop 2019-20. Uh, we first off continue to make small marginal adjustments down in harvested acreage and yield. Uh, the USDA again in their grain stocks reports mentioned uh, the unusual amount of corn that in the upper Midwest that's still out in the field. And we think that we'll see some small adjustments down eventually because of that of 200,000 uh, acres of We'll lose 200,000 acres of uh, in the final harvested tally for corn, and maybe about a half a bushel on yield, which will drop our production for 2019 down to uh, 13,618. We add it all up, we have a little bit lower supply, 15,884 than the last WASDE. Uh, the big thing uh, going forward right now is, well, what are you going to do with your feed and residual after that bullish uh, stocks report? Uh, it turns out that there's a variety of positive and negative factors. If we didn't have the coronavirus going on right now, uh, it would be fairly straightforward what to do. We had roughly 170 million bushel uh, bullish or positive surprise on usage in the second quarter of the marketing year. And a typical way that Todd and I like to do that is just fade that about half. So you would, you know, maybe add 75 or 80 million bushels to your previous feed residual estimate uh, by fading that surprise by about half. That's that's kind of a rule of thumb that we use. And that's what we roughly did by now penciling in feed and residual use for corn at 5.6 billion bushels for the 1920 marketing year. But we have to recognize there's a lot else obviously going on. Uh, on the positive side, as I'll get to in a a minute, the negative of uh, declining ethanol uh, use for corn means that we're going to have less available supplies of DDGs, which some of that will likely end up coming back in the form of increased corn feed and residual use. That's on the positive side, but on the negative side, we also know that we are going through some kind of uh, unprecedented flash economic contraction, uh, maybe a flash recession uh, due to the coronavirus. And that undoubtedly eventually is going to, uh, depending on how long it persists, going to have a negative impact on the demand for uh, meat. And so that could have a negative impact as we feed animals in the short run to potentially lighter weights to get them moved through the system. So a lot going on, but for now we're going to stick with that 5600 estimate. Uh, ethanol is a, another area where we could spend a lot of time talking about. I just point out that uh, last Thursday Todd and I had a Farm Doc Daily article that specifically took a deep dive look at what might be happening with ethanol demand destruction in our current coronavirus pandemic. Uh, that analysis suggests that uh, from March through May alone, probably losing 250 to 300 million bushels of corn demand for making ethanol. And so that's why we have dropped our estimate over the WASD uh, March 10th number by. Uh, 300 million bushels. Depending on the length and severity of the pandemic, uh, that number uh, could 
actually go down even further. Uh, probably uh, not a great chance, but there's always some chance that we could be a little bit pessimistic, but that would uh, take kind of some very dramatic and quick turnarounds in the restrictions and sheltering at home and social distancing measures that we're currently experiencing here in the U.S. So I think something in that range of 25 uh, 250 to 300 million bushels down on corn ethanol usage seems kind of safe. A uh, lot of discussion about weakness in corn exports in the current marketing year, but we are also seeing some very nice um, inspections and sales numbers lately. So we're going to stick with the USDA's uh, current estimate for corn exports of 1725. Put it all together, we have total use of 13845, giving us an ending stocks of just a smidgen over 2 billion bushels, ending stocks to use ratio of 14.7%, and a season average price now dropping to 355. You have to remember that we had roughly half of the marketing year with uh, prices much higher than we have seen since the coronavirus pandemic broke out. When you average those, looks to us like something around that 355. So that's what the old crop corn looks like to us. Uh, Jim, if you could uh, move on to uh, soybeans. Uh, the USDA's March 1 soybean stock number, 2253, very close to what the market expected. Uh, next slide. And so we can see a very small surprise, so we wouldn't think of much market impact from that uh, report uh, piece of information. Uh, go to the next slide. So here's where we're at uh, for the uh, old crop soybean balance sheet for 2019-20. We're the same as the USDA's March 10th WASD all the way through on supply, uh, same on crush. Uh, we're a little bit more bearish on uh, O-crop exports. We're penciling in a number of 1775, giving us total consumption of uh, a little bit over 4 billion bushels, gives us an ending stocks estimate of uh, 474 million uh, bushels, ending stocks used increase, uh, stocks to use ratio 11.8%, and we dropped the season average price by a dime. So that's the old crop outlook. I'm going to turn it over now uh, to Todd to talk about uh, new crop and the prospective planting report. Thank you, Scott. So we had just a massive amount of acres planted in the perspective, well, supposedly to be planted in the prospective planting report. Principal crop acres of over 319 million acres. And as you can see from this map provided by NAS, a lot of blue especially through the heart of the corn belt. Now, a lot of this is from last year and recovery from when we saw a lot of acres taken out um, from prevent plant acres. But nonetheless, this is a reversion to the acreage levels we saw a few years ago. Jim, could you click the next slide? Here's an idea. I, what we put together here is just an acreage summary. Principal crops are the green part of the stack. CRP is blue and prevent plant is red. And you can see last year, we had 19.6 million acres of prevent plant. A huge, huge chunk of that, over 15 million acres, was corn and soybeans. Right now, we're penciling CRP of about 22.5 million acres. Now, that's below, I think, um, the amount available is around 24.5 million acres, but I haven't seen those numbers coming up above 22.5 yet. And we're sort of saying about a 3 million acre prevent plant. Could that go higher? Yes, but it would come up out of the principal crop acreage but overall you can see that when you add these three categories together the amount of acreage has been relatively stable over the last four years and this year's somewhat of a, a move back to what we saw in 2016 a little bit but basically flat somewhere between 343 and a half to 345 and a half million acres of principal crops crp acres and prevent plant. So let's talk about corn a little bit. Oh, this number is a real hard burn for a lot of us that follow the markets and want corn prices to be higher. Basically 97 million acres of corn in the prospective plantings report, well above what the trade was guessing, well above what USDA was saying, and I think above even what some of the more pessimistic market observers are saying. 
this is a lot of acres, folks, and any decent year at all if this comes to fruition. And I think Scott and I both are a little skeptical of this coming to complete fruition this in the 2020 crop year. But to fade it more than two or three million acres, I think that's a big fade. So, you know, we could still be talking about 95 million acres unless there's a huge change of heart about what people are going to plant this spring. Go to the next slide. As you can see, state by state, you know, this year we're up 7.3 million acres from last year and we're up 7.8 million acres from 2018. So I know in the Corn Belt we like to plant corn and we continue to plant massive amounts of corn acres. All through the heart of the Corn Belt, I was saying they're going to plant over 14 million acres of corn, which, you know, even from 2018, that's 900,000 acres more than they did in 2018. And it's about, I think, 800,000 more than they did last year, somewhere in that range. South Dakota saying they're going to plant 6 million acres of corn. There's a lot of corn being planted through the heart of the Corn Belt. If this number comes to fruition, we're talking a really large supply leading into the 2020-2021 marketing year. Next slide, Jim. When we look at actual planted acres minus March intentions, last year we saw it go down 3 million acres. The huge you know, weather problems we had through the planting season, the massive amount of prevent planted acres for both corn and beans and made a lot of crops really. So what was a record change from actual planted acres, less the March intentions. And we have seen in the past near 2 million acres worth of change like we saw back in 2013. But to think that we're gonna fade this four or five million acres may be a bit of a stretch in my opinion. Next slide, Jim. We look at soybean acres up to 83.5 million acres. That's lower than what the trade was expecting. That's lower than what USDA had penciled in. and I could see this number going up before it's all said and done. When we, when we, we'll talk about the balance sheets for 2020, 2021 in a minute, but how much is the question? Next slide, Jim. So when we look at the soybean planted area, some decent size increases, which you would expect when we saw all those huge prevent plant acres, up 9.7 million acres from 2019. I, to me, this is a bit of a head scratcher. Down 5.6 million acres from 2018. I don't know what you think, Scott, but I sort of felt like there'd be more soybean acres as we sort of reverted in the rotations. And that seems like still quite a bit down from 2018 to me. If this comes to fruition, it may help soybean prices a bit, but it really does mean there's going to be a lot of corn out there. Well, I, I completely agree with you, Todd, that, uh, uh, particularly that uh, comparison to 2018 is uh, really important to think through. We basically had even corn and soybean planted acres in 2018. And, you know, um, ever since the trade war has st you know started, we've just seen this stampede to corn uh, by Corn Belt farmers here in the U.S. And the evidence here is it has continued. Yeah, it doesn't look like we're going to get back to 89, 89 anytime soon. So when we look at actual soybean acres planted less March and tens last year, over 8.5 million acres, a huge drop due to the prevent planting. That's an all-timer. We have seen times when it's been well over 2 million acres. You know, what's it going to be in 2020? It depends. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a blue bar um, for 2020 before it's all said and done. In other words, the planted acres go up. Um, next slide, please. When we look at planted acres minus harvested acres of corn, it's usually somewhere around 7.4, 7.5 million acres. We saw more in 2019 than we traditionally see. It really does depend on what kind of weather we get into and what kind of crop loss we see through the 2020 growing season. Next. Corn yield. Now, we were down last year, and right now the USDA is 168 in 2019. And considering the kind of year we had, that's really still an impressive yield um, for 2019. In 2020, I've got a trend yield of about 177.5 bushels per acre. My great fear is that we do end up planting 95 plus million acres, and we have 
an unbelievable growing season. And we see 2020 yields, you know, pushing 180. We will be swimming in corn if that occurs, folks. That is going to happen if we have a good growing season and plant those kind of acres. Right now, I'm pencing in a trend yield of about 177.5. Jim. So let's look at the 2020-2021 balance sheet. Now, we're using USD's outlook form for 2020-2021 to give you a comparison in the left-hand column. It's not really too fair because they haven't they won't bring out their estimates till may i think scott and i both agree that we may be able to fade those planted acres to maybe three million acres before it's all said and done but even if we do two million acres less that's still 95 million acres and it is feasible that we will plant 97 million acres at some you know it could be it could happen we plant 95 million acres that puts us harvesting around 87.6 if you take um, the average relationship between planted and harvested for grain with the 177 and a half trend yield we get a production number of 15.5 you to add 2 million more acres to that and up that yield a bit we could be pushing over 16 billion bushels of production pretty easily in a decent crop year you know, we're carrying in a little over 2 billion bushels, which puts total supply in our balance sheets a little over 17.6 billion bushels. Now, we've got feed and residual going up in 2020-2021. We're putting in about 5.7 billion bushels. Depending on how long this recession lasts, depending on what it does to meet demand in the livestock herd, it looks like supply is going to pull back maybe a little bit in the second half of the year. That should be a pretty good residual. We're around 5.7 billion bushels. Talking about ethanol, and as Scott talked about this earlier, you know, we're fading at 300 million bushels in the 1920 marketing year. If we do, if we do get out of this problem in a month or two, which is a big if, and things can sort of revert back to a decent pace, the oil war is still going on. I think gasoline prices will still be low, and it looks like the market thinks, barring some resolution, that this will continue maybe through next March. You could see really low gasoline prices, which would probably um, spur miles driven if people get back out and moving around, which could be very supportive for ethanol. Right now, we're a little bit above, in a normal year without any trouble, around 5.375 to 5.4 billion bushels is what we'd see for ethanol use with decent exports. I think we could see some strength if things get back to normal in a two to three month window. If they don't, this thing's going to linger and who will be left, you know, producing ethanol on the backside of all this is a big question. We've seen corn bases, ethanol prices, and ethanol plants plummet, dragging down corn prices all over the place. The uncertainty is huge. Right now, we're penciling about 5.475 billion bushels. You may see a little bit less food seed and industrial use than we've currently pegged in. I don't think so from some of the domestic use. At that kind of production level and with the kind of export strength, I think we're going to see building through the latter half of 2020. 2.15 billion bushels, I think, is a very reasonable estimate for corn exports in 2021. Now, it's a long ways out. A lot depends on what happens with that Safrina crop in Brazil. But even if they have a decent crop, they need it domestically. You know, depending on how the supply chains in the world, if they stay intact and we can keep moving it, I think we're going to be in a good place to be strong corn exporters. But even with over 14.7 billion bushels of use, that's pushing ending stocks up near 2.9 billion bushels. But the stocks use around 19.7%. An average price of 335, it could be lower. It really does depend on what kind of crop we end up putting out and how we emerge from this either V, U, or prolonged recession that the coronavirus is sparking. Next slide, Jim. We look at plant amount of harvested acres of beans. Typically, we're in the 800,000 range. We see, we've seen elevated numbers the last couple of years. I think 800,000 acres is a safe estimate on average. Next slide. Well, I've got a little bit higher trend yield than USDA. 
with a decent year, 50.3 bushels per acre of soybeans does not seem unreasonable. I mean, it could be lower than that. You could see it a bushel lower. But right now, I'm penciling 50.3. The kind of soybean yields we've seen over the last few years and even last year under just most of the acres going in way late. Uh, the seed technology is impressive, and I think we could see a really good soybean yield with any kind of decent year whatsoever. Next slide. So when we look at the balance sheets, and once again, this is from USDA's Outlook Forum, the left column, and then our right column is ours. We're raising the planted acreage a little bit for soybeans in counter to the, what we dropped in corn. We got 85.5 million acres of soybeans planted. It puts us at about 84.7 harvested with a 50.3 trend yield. Puts production about 4.26 billion bushels. Carrying in 474 puts total supply about 4.75 billion bushels. We've got crush at 2.12, depending on how all this works out. And as we see China and other places in the world rebuild their hog herd, and if problems continue in Argentina, we could see crush be one, one not one, stronger this year than we've currently penciled in, but I don't think you'll see it much more than 10 to 15 million bushels stronger this year. And it could be once again, 10 to 15 stronger next year if we can continue it. I'm putting exports at about 2.1 billion bushels. We've seen China start to buy beans. I think, you know, barring any kind of political breakdown, as they try to rebuild their hog herd, as they get crushing back online, I think they are going to buy, buy significantly and meet some of their phase one trade commitments. And that means, I think, pretty strong soybean sales in the 2020-2021 marketing year. So I've got it at 2.1 billion bushels. Keep the seed and feed at about the same. So we're looking at total consumption about 4.354 billion bushels. With that kind of acreage and that kind of yield, ending stocks go up a little bit from, go down from last year but up above what USDA is saying, about 395 million bushels. So stocks to use of about 91.1% and a seasonal average price of around 860. Now, uh, yes, sir. Can we go back to that slide? Yeah, go back. A uh, couple things I just wanted to point out. Um, we are increasing planted acreage from the prospective plantings report which was 83.5 million to 85.5, which puts us very close to what the USDA was forecasting at their Outlook Forum in February. So just make sure that people are not confused by that comparison. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're, we're up in the perspective planted bean acreage by two. That's by right. two million. But yeah. notice that if we're wrong in that, that you if you take off those two million uh, planted acres that we include, you get a very bullish scenario on ending stocks for soybeans. Because yeah. those two million if acres. If the trade comes through, yep, trade and crush come through, it would be pretty bullish. You know, you and would. Uh, it. Yeah, yeah, you would You would drop that probably at least 100. The ending stocks by around 100 million bushels, which getting us down below 300 is very, very tight ending stocks. So on the that's why on the face of it, the 83.5 million prospective plantings number for uh, U.S. soybeans is in isolation, not considering everything else going on, is a very bullish number. But that, that's all I just wanted to add. No, and that's true. That is true. And we're not thus far away, so I haven't seen that kind of reaction in the market. We may see it as we move forward. Right. Next slide, Jim. So overall, March stocks are lower than we expected. We got a, we're forecasting feed and residual up. Farmers intend to plant 7.3 million more acres of corn, a little bit fewer spring wheat acres, but not much, slightly more sorghum acres, more bean acres, just not as much as we expected, slightly fewer cotton acres. So we expect larger corn crops, soybean crops in 2020. Expect slight increase, I know they got a typo here in corn, a uh, substantial increase in corn stocks if these acreage hold, but even if they don't hold, if we only drop them one or two million acres, it's going up. And soybean stocks to decrease modestly if we stick with the acreage we're on, and even if we raise them a little bit. So lower corn soybean prices in 2020, 2021, but, you know, the big question is, are for me coming out of this, are we going to plant those acres? If we do, 
if we do plant 97 million corn acres and this thing lingers on for months on end, you know, actively getting in on those corn prices, it seems crazy to talk about hedging 330 or 320 corn prices, but, you know, a big crop could have us swimming in corn. Scott, you got anything to add? No, I I don't. Um, Next I slide. Think, are we ready for questions? Oh, yeah, let's do some questions. I mm -hmm. like questions better than anything. All right. Well, just a reminder for our uh, listeners, uh, please uh, be uh, submitting your questions on your uh, GoToWebinar dashboard. Uh, we have several already, and we'll get started on those. Uh, I think the question of the hour is this one. Uh, on acres that can be switched, Todd, do 860 beans beat 335 corn? What do you <laughs> this, this is the big question, right? That is the big question, right? Yeah. What do you think, man? Well, I guess it really does depend on what kind of crop you think you can grow, right? And what kind of year we're on. It seems to me they do. Um, for most people that I care about, well, we care about more than people in Illinois. We just care about people in Illinois more than others. Um, I think for a lot of farmers in Illinois, it may. And honestly, that 860 bean price, you're going to have opportunities for higher than that in, uh, here in Illinois, right? That's a seasonal average price across the country. Does everybody understand what we're saying? So those huge negative bases you see out in the Western Corn Belt, and the same goes for corn, but with the kind of demand issues and uncertainty around corn I see right now, it feels to me, and sitting here right now, talk to me in a month, but right now, bean acres seem less risky. I don't know what you think, Scott, but that's the way it feels to me. No, I, I mean, let's just kind of, run down the the list of you know profit indicators right now um you know different ways to look at the decision but uh just right out of the new crop price ratio in uh the uh, corn and soybean futures markets uh that's at a ratio that's favoring uh soybean planting right now uh it's not a huge incentive but it's there uh if we look at uh the Revenue guarantee for crop insurance, the kind of policies typically used, uh, 80 or 85 percent. Uh, those have a slight bias towards uh, soybean acres. Uh, if we add on top of that the, um, the PLC uh, ARC County incentives those probably are shaded a bit more towards corn uh so uh you know as you line up the factors they certainly do seem to favor um a different proportion out of that 180 million acre pie that we kind of have as the base for corn and soybeans going towards soybeans to me the the question of the hour is uh, i really don't believe we'll plant 83 million acres of soybeans um, how flexible will farmers be in terms of being being able at this fairly late date to switch towards soybeans? Because most of the uh, indicators are flashing right now, planting more soybeans. Then you add on top of that a huge unknown is we're trying to figure this out right in the middle of this unprecedented, um, you know, black swan type of coronavirus pandemic and you know, what kind of logistical issues might there be uh, for a uh, high input production uh, crop like corn relative to soybeans that is not as high of input and maybe has somewhat of a wider planting window uh, if things get slowed down. So there's certainly a lot of different factors at play here, but most of the indicators I think line up towards planting more soybeans right now. Uh, I think the overall picture that I keep really rolling around in my mind, Todd, is that, boy, the trade war really spooked farmers in the U.S. Corn Belt away from soybeans. And it'll be interesting to see if the coronavirus kind of now offsets that and uh, those impacts as they feed through, particularly ethanol, uh, bring it, swing us 
back a little or a lot towards a more even split of that 180 million acres. So that's kind of my flow of consciousness about uh, <laughs> about corn and soybean acres right now. Mm-hmm. So uh, you want to pick the next one, Todd? Uh, well, I'm just going from the top. It says reports of lots of ethanol plants idled impacts on stocks and commodity price. Um, there have been a lot of ethanol plants idled, and I said in the talk, you know, we've seen basis, corn basis, that ethanol plants tank over the last few weeks. And as Scott said, we tried to do some calculations on what kind of demand destruction we'll see. It will, you know, if we can't get those ethanol plants back up online, um, it has already impacted corn prices and the, and the kind of weakness you've seen in corn prices relative to, say, wheat and um, soybeans is reflective of that. Anything to add to that, Scott? Well, we talked about what they'll do in stocks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that our estimates were probably smaller than a lot of people are thinking about the hit to total corn use, you know, 250 to 300 million bushels is is the range that we think is reasonable that you can project uh, right now. Obviously, it depends greatly on how long these uh, shelter in place, social distancing restrictions are um, in place. Uh, but I also think it's very important to keep in mind that on the back side of this, I mean, we could be having some of the lowest gasoline prices we have seen in 20 years uh, on the back side of this. You know, the wholesale uh, price of gasoline blend stocks have been down around 50 uh, cents or less, which, you know, puts uh, gasoline prices in some parts of the country eventually under a dollar a bushel, a dollar a bushel, dollar a gallon. So, you know, you got to kind of balance those two things. Uh, I had an interesting question, Todd, asks uh, if oil prices are 20 to $30 per barrel and gas prices are around $2 a gallon, what price does corn need to be to make ethanol competitive? Uh, I think if oil prices are 20 to $30 a barrel, I think we're more likely to see gas prices, you know, uh, maybe around $1.25 to $1.50 than $2 a gallon. But it's an interesting question of what price of corn is needed to make ethanol competitive. This is where it gets really complicated, the policy Mm. piece of this, because Mm. we have to remember that the RFS puts a safety net under uh, total corn ethanol demand. Now, another layer of uh, complexity is the way the RFS mandates are implemented for 2020. At this point, uh, they're a percentage mandate rather than absolute volume mandate. So the way I like to put it is the RFS mandates pretty much mean that um, we're going to use, we're going to continue to see 10% ethanol in whatever is the final gasoline uh, consumption in the U.S. for 2020. If you know, we drop from, say, 142 billion gallons to, say, 130 billion gallons. Well, those 130 billion gallons are going to see uh, 10% uh, ethanol, E10 blends. So that'd be 13 billion gallons. So I think that there's some confusion about just how far off the cliff that uh, ethanol usage could fall, depending on how far uh, gasoline usage uh, declines. So that's where the RFS does potentially come in and helps shore up ethanol maintaining 10%. And I think you see this in the uh, degree that uh, ethanol prices, as low as they are, have not fallen proportionately nearly as much as wholesale gasoline prices. And I think that reflects the safety net feature of the RFS, at least partially. Mm-hmm. So I've been talking enough, Todd. You're up. All right. <laughs> There's a series of questions. Is could we see more spring wheat acreage um, in states that you know switching out of corn and beans? I mean, it's feasible. Um, right now, they're down a little bit. I don't. 
I will be skeptical if we see a large increase in spring wheat acres, but we do see very strong wheat prices, and that is more than feasible. I'm happy for anybody that wants to plant spring wheat out in the Dakotas. Go to it, whoever wants to do it. Um, but how much are we talking? Uh, I really don't know. Scott, do you have any insight on that one? Uh, I think I'm just going to let you handle that one. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we could. Um, we could. But how many acres are we talking? I don't think it's going to be enough to offset these huge corn acres we're talking about. Yeah. So, yeah, let's see here. I've got one here. It says, I've read several times recently how ethanol prices are in the tank do low oil prices how's that work great question um obviously ethanol prices and, and oil prices have been going down but it's not really due to low oil prices the reason that both have been going down is because of the economic well the economic contraction what's really going on is it's um the pandemic restrictions on sheltering in place and social distancing and closing of businesses means that we're just putting an absolute basically uh, ceiling on miles driven. And, you know, that's causing a sharp, sudden reduction in gasoline use, which causes a sharp, sudden reduction in ethanol use. That's what's going on. It's not really that low oil prices are themselves causing the drop in uh, ethanol prices. They're both reacting to the same thing. Did I put that right, Todd? Yes. Well, yeah, there's you. a demand destruction on the gas. Back. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm following it. It's the demand destruction on the gasoline side that takes 10% of ethanol out of every gallon, right? Yep. Um, yep. Low, low oil and low gasoline prices in a normal period of time would probably spur demand for gasoline, which would help ethanol production. But and if you'll note, Todd, we, we had calibrated some of that into the 2021 balance sheet when you saw our, probably did. for most I tried, people, I tried uh, that there's a, we have a surprisingly robust expectation for ethanol use in the 2021 marketing year because of exactly that point that uh, we expect by September, hopefully we're not over optimistic that we'll be through all, but you know maybe some residual impacts of this. And what we'll be left with is really low gasoline and crude oil prices, which will uh, clearly spur driving, and there'll probably be even some catch up. We'll all want to. I suspect we're going to have, a, whenever this is over, Todd, we are going to have a burst of social activity like this country probably hasn't seen since like the end of World War II or something like that. Everybody's going to want to get out and celebrate and see everybody else. Oh, I know. I'm going to drive all over the place when this is over. Just Windows down, yeah. yelling at everybody. <laughs> yeah, have me out. I'll come and yeah, I'll come and talk. Whoever wants to see me. Yeah, no, uh, I think that's true. And hopefully, we can get this in good order and everybody's okay. There's an interesting one. Is irrigated acreage continuing to increase in the eastern Corn Belt and southeast states and affecting yield stability and growth? Uh, we have actually done some work on that uh, a couple years ago, Todd and I and Daryl Good. Uh, unfortunately, this year, the USDA stopped collecting data uh, on a state level uh, on irrigated acres and yields for uh, corn and soybeans. So the answer is we don't know. Given the margin compression situation that we've been under, I'd be very surprised if we have seen much expansion here in the Eastern Corner Belt and the Southeast on um, irrigated acres because of the capital costs of doing so. I don't know. What do you think, Todd? Yeah, I don't think we're going to see a, ma a major expansion of it, to be honest with you. But and for the reason you're talking about. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I think so, the uh, next question, looking out several years, can the growth of corn and soybean acres continue? If so, is this due to economics or the lack of market infrastructure around other crops? Interesting question. What do you think, Todd? Um, 
Well, long run demand wise in the globe, you know, if everybody, and we don't go in some major depression and global recession for extended periods of time, which I don't think we will, or maybe that's just wishful thinking. Higher incomes, more meat consumption, growth and feed use, more modern livestock industries in some of these major consuming countries as they grow. We've already started to see it in places like China, maybe India coming online, Indonesia. I think there's a place for corn and soybeans and an expansion. The other problem is we've got some pretty strong competitors that have come in place. Brazil, Argentina, it looks like Ukraine may be loosening up their farmland sales requirements, which may you know, boost their productivity in the long run. So there's always going to be this give and take between our competitors and us to take market share in a lot of these high growth areas, particularly in Asia. And one of these days in Africa, we're going to see them start to develop as well. So in the long run, I think there's demand there. And I think we can still see it grow, maybe not as fast as some people would like, and it may take a little bit longer than some people would like. But I don't think it's all gloom and doom for the very long run. Now, having said that, you know, we're not, this is not when everybody started seeing, you know, above $5, $6 corn prices and $13 bean prices and all this talk of commodity super cycles and all this. I don't want to call it noise, but I will anyway, noise. And, you know, we're talking about margins that are hopefully a little bit better than what we see now in the long run. I don't know what you think, Scott. Yeah, I think one of the things in answering the question that is important to consider, it's easy to miss the stability in the size of the total acres that we're planting to corn and soybeans. You know, we're seeing huge swings in the composition from year to year right now, but the total of about 180 million acres planted to corn and soybeans has been pretty stable for a number of years now. Uh, I don't know exactly how far back that would go, Todd. Do you have that off the top of your head? It's about 2015, I think it is. Yeah, I think for at least five years, it looks like we're pretty steady on that total, but some wild swings from year to year. And yes. I, I, I don't see that probably changing a lot. No, and I mean, there is potential for some growth there. Um, but it's not a huge growth, right? We're not talking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here's a question. Are we going to have enough containers to ship out soybeans as we have had? Is the soybean meal demand since DDG production is cut able to make up the shipment difference? Um, so that's an interesting question, kind of getting into that shipping and logistics uh, part of the supply chain. What do you think, Todd? I think we will have the containers. I mean, there's a, it really does come down to how we come out of this globally, the supply chains emerge from this problem that we're currently in right now. Um, I think, and yeah, there's a lot of negativity around China right now for what I consider to be a lot of very good reasons, but they're still going to need the beans. We're probably still going to make stuff there. I think the flow will be there um, and other places in Asia as well. So depending on how we emerge from this and if we can keep poor infrastructure, not just here, but in other places open and flowing, and it may take a while to get back. I hope by this fall we're in a place where we can, or at least this summer, heck, I'd happy, be happy if next month, but, you know, we can get back to a place where we can move in due order. Um, I do think soybean mill demand for the exports is going to be strong this marketing year, particularly since Argentina is going through a lot of issues, some self-inflicted, some due to the coronavirus. It's very um, supportive for crush. And I think for us as a competitor, the soybean meal export market. So I don't I don't see it as like offsetting per se. I think as we move through the rest of this marketing year, we get some kind of um, confirmation or resolution or some idea of how this is all going to turn out and move into 2020, 2021. I think it'll be there. 
you know, I don't know what your opinion on that is, Scott. Yeah, let's see. I want to um, take this question because uh, we really haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. How might the coronavirus itself affect farmers' planting decisions or even their ability to plant? And how, how severe do we think over the next month? Let's just take it from there. We can at least have some idea of the restriction. You know, the president has, you know, recommended through the end of April uh, these uh, restrictions, um, you know, on, you know, guidelines for social distancing, so on. Uh, probably a lot of these states that have them here in the Corn Belt are going to continue with those. Uh, I realize that food production is exempted, but can we kind of uh, think through and help people think through how severe could the uh, logistical problems get in terms of planting corn and soybeans in the next month, assuming it dries out and we have the weather we need to plant? What do you think, Todd? I lost you. Oh, I literally okay. couldn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, no. basically, what kind of logistical problems can we foresee for uh, farmers planting corn and soybeans in the next month? We already have, we can kind of see what the restrictions are in place. Yeah. You know, we're seeing some reports of, uh, you know, uh, labor uh, issues slowing down because of the disease, you know, threats of striking at uh, Amazon. We saw reports today of a slaughtering plant in Pennsylvania, you know, so what kind of things might we see in the next month that we maybe could never imagine before that would directly impact uh, our ability to plant the 2020 corn and soybean crops? Well, from from everything I've seen and heard and talking to people, most most states have placed agriculture in a you know necessary work or whatever they want to call it, so you're not restricted in your movements to do it. I think maybe the supply chains for inputs, I think they're there. I haven't heard anything definite about having real hard issues on inputs moving around yet, but they could happen if we see um, port facilities or river structure or, you know, in places shut down and lock up. And, but, you know, on the farm itself, labor issues could be an issue. And depending on how big a farm you got and how many laborers you have in place. I think here in Illinois, maybe not so much, but if you're talking about, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, vegetable and fruit growers, that, you know, harvesting could be a real problem. but I think right now over the next month, other than losing um, slaughter facilities, getting shut down, slowing down the flow of um, livestock through the supply chain, which slows down the flow of grain out of bins, which pushes prices down. I don't see, I personally don't see a lot of um, issues other than, you know, God forbid farmers are getting sick with the coronavirus and not being able to do their work. I don't see a lot of issues. Maybe you do. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's the thing for farmers to really be on the watch out is anything in terms of their input suppliers that would slow the process down. You know, what if you got a, uh, an infection that closed down, you know, much of your local uh, uh, co-op or your uh, local fertilizer plant and you were depending on them to apply your uh, fertilizer and uh, herbicide? Uh, that could be a problem. And so we'll really be wanting to monitor that really closely. But my own personal expectation is those will probably be, some of those are going to happen, uh, but I think that they'll be more localized than over a widespread area. This is one of the places where, you know, uh, the uh, isolation out there in uh, uh, rural farming areas is actually a real benefit. You know, it lessens the probability of getting getting the disease. Uh, but it's certainly not impossible, and people will want to be monitoring it really carefully. Um, it's a question, you might have already answered this. So said, uh, do you think there's a possibility we're going to see switching from corn to spring wheat in these marginal corn-producing states? Uh, 
particularly up north? What do you think? Yeah, I thought maybe we could. I'm just not sure the kind of acreage we'd like to see is going to move the needle all that much on 97 million acres of corn. Um, <laughs> That's you know, a lot. We may be, yeah, we may be talking half a million acres. You know, um, you know, on the same side, you know, I've I've certainly in recent days picked up a lot of discussion about uh, how miserably low cotton prices are, and so that they'd be switching out of cotton. Um, you know, could soybeans pick up some more acres that way? Yes, I think down in the uh, mid south region. I mean, when you look at our map there that we had on soybean acreage and the changes, I think you saw Mississippi's up in soybean acres this year. Uh, we saw, and I think sorghum in particular in the high plains of Texas probably picked up some acres from cotton because China did start buying sorghum almost immediately after the phase one trade deal once and for all showing how important whiskey is to everybody around the world <laughs> um, so i think there's can't a have real, shortage of that can no, you? no you can't you can't let that go there's a lot of things you can let go but not that um so i think yeah cotton acreage is down and i think you'll see some soybean acres take up some of it in mid-south but i think also I think Sorghum might have bought some cotton acres in the high plains as well. Yeah. Uh, here's an interesting one that uh, I can take. It says, what impact will unharvested corn crop in northern states have on ability to plant corn this year? Will more acres shift to beans? Uh, I think you probably are seeing some of that effect in North Dakota, uh, where, if I have memory serves me right, Todd, uh, Corn acres are down relative to 2019. Did I have that right for North Dakota, Todd? Um, no, they're down from 18, but um, yeah, they're down from 19. Yeah, they're down. 300,000 acres, yeah. yeah, 300, yeah. Acres. And so uh, that that could be evidence that, uh, you know, and I don't blame them if I you know, there's, who knows, the, there's hundreds of thousands of acres of corn that are still out in the field in uh, North Dakota. And after, you know, what I've seen and uh, acquaintances up there have shown me of the miserable process of getting that crop out this year, you know, who could blame them for probably scaling back corn production some. And also then in light of the signals to plant more soybeans and maybe some more spring wheat, uh, I wouldn't even be surprised that, uh, will be down more than 300,000 uh, acres up in North Dakota when all is said and done. Uh, but I think the question is, will the existence of the corn out in the field actually cause problems if they want to go back to corn? Uh, I guess I think that that's probably unlikely. Uh, they've actually been drying, uh, drying out pretty well up there. And so I expect that that planting and March or planting, excuse me, harvesting March, early April will get done pretty rapidly, and there's still plenty of time for them to to plant it to corn, uh, assuming the weather and the conditions allow it. So I don't think that that itself. I think it's just more accumulation of the hassles and the uh, how difficult the conditions were that they probably don't want to risk that for a while on quite as large as a scale. Well, one last other question you would like to pick out of here, Todd, and we'll finish up. Well, I'm going to pick this one on someone asked about cattle rations. He said he's losing three to five net energy units by going to gluten or, or just corn roughage and pellets. Now, performance is lost, and the longer on feed would be more total feed use unless they sell them under finish to avoid a further uh, market fat market drop. Would that be bullish or bearish on corn usage? And we've seen cattle particularly fed to higher weights. I don't think that's going to continue as we move through 2020. I think you may see people move. It would be bullish for corn usage and feed, and we did up our feed usage number. I think once we get the supply chains worked out and settled out and the supply contracts a little bit, hopefully cattle finishers can get in a better margin place. Um, so overall, longer on feed would be bullish. I'm not expecting feeding to high weights moving forward. I could be wrong on that. So I think it's sort of a net wash when it's all said and done. And I mean, you sort of mentioned that, Scott, when you're talking about our feeding residual number. So, yes, 
longer on feed would be bullish for feed usage. How long will that go on? Maybe the next couple of months. I don't see it going on forever. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in to our webinar this afternoon. I do want to alert you that we have uh, a we another webinar upcoming in our Farm Doc Daily Live series on coronavirus and ag uh, this uh, Friday at 11 a.m. on April 3rd. You will not want to miss it. Rob Johansson, Chief Economist of the U.S. Department of Ag, uh, will be our featured guest to talk about COVID-19 in the ag sector and what the USDA is working on. And he will be joined and hosted by Jonathan Kappas of our Farm Doc team. Uh, so continue to look for these twice weekly Farm Doc Daily Live uh, special webinar series on coronavirus. And we also, as always, want to thank all of our Farm Doc sponsors. Uh, we're very grateful for each and every one of them. And with that, we're going to sign off. Everyone uh, be safe and healthy, and we will be back with you soon. Thank you. Yep, thank you.